I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the Vietnam Veterans News Podcast. News of interest about Vietnam veterans from a Vietnam veteran. Now, here's your host, Mac Payne. This is Mac Payne here with episode 1789er of the Vietnam Veteran News Podcast. News about the Vietnam War and the brave veterans who served there, as told to you by yours truly, a Vietnam veteran. This episode is brought to you by the Legacy Staff by Brazos Walking Sticks in beautiful Waco, Texas. Just go to BrazosSticks.com and use my name, Mac Payne. That's M-A-C-K-P-A-Y-N-E with no space. Make it one word. Use that at the checkout and you will get a 10% discount off your next order of the Legacy Staff or cane of your own design. You can also go to the podcast website, VietnamVeteranNews.com, and check on the link there. It'll be right there at the top of the page. I encourage you to get one of these staffs. They are a beautiful work of art. I have one myself, and I have discovered, just as it said in the Bible, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will be comforted by a staff and a rod. This staff definitely is comforting to me, and it will be to you. So don't delay. Go over to the website, click on the Brazo Sticks picture, and you'll have your stick in no time. They'll take good care of you out there in Waco, making a staff just for you. In this episode of this podcast, we have the honor and privilege of hearing Vietnam veteran John Shoemaker tell about a dark day in the Vietnam War. That day was August the 26th, 1970. The location was LZ Judy. LZ Judy was located in the Badlands, about 50 miles west of Tam Ki in i up north in Vietnam. On that day at LZ Judy, we suffered the worst aircraft loss of personnel in combat in the war. 31 American soldiers from the 196th Infantry Brigade and the Marical Division died that day. John Shoemaker was there. He saw the entire tragic event unfold from start to finish. He's going to tell you about it in his own words and be prepared. It's going to be a gut-wrenching story. John Shoemaker tells it like it is. He does not sugarcoat it. It's a story that must be told because we must always remember the bravery of our men in uniform. We must never forget. After you hear this, you won't forget. I'll guarantee you. So without any further ado, let's get to it. John, you've got the microphone. Take it away. Thank you, Mac. I appreciate the opportunity here as your support for the effort here to uh, bring honor and remembrance to those soldiers who sacrificed so much during the Vietnam War. Uh, So I do appreciate it. John, you are very welcome, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on here and telling us these stories, because it is stories that must be told, and you're doing a great job, so go for it. I can't wait to hear your next story. As has been the case, every one of these is absolutely true. There's no exaggeration. I am recounting everything from my notes and from memory uh, 50 years later, uh, and having documented much of this in articles that have been published over the years, about 20 different articles in the newspapers and magazines. In any event, to understand the story of the tragedy at LZ Judy, which was located west of Chulai and northeast of Cam Duck, kind of in the middle of South Vietnam at a fire base. But before we go there, I need to go back to Cam Duck and explain that our operation lasted for over two months in 
bringing a battalion and other units, regiments, artillery, air assets, and so forth, to bring the bear on the Kandak located next to the Laotian border and interdicting the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We saw lots of contact, lots of activity. I believe the battalion counted well over 250 NVA were killed with few losses, certainly less than uh, a dozen. And at the same time, we recovered the remains of uh, a number of special forces that were left there after the base was overrun in 1968 during Minitet, when the NVA attacked uh, in a massive attack uh, that overran the base, but we were able to escape. In any event, in 1970, in August, we're now at the end of this operation called Elk Canyon. The intent was to move everybody out. To do that is a massive logistical exercise, coordination, the bringing in of a large troop carriers like the CH-47 Chinook, along with Hueys, protected by Cobras, and, of course, with fighters on standby, the artillery that had to be lifted out by sky cranes, we call them. And so it was uh, an ongoing effort uh, over the course of a few days. And on the airstrip at the southern end, near the uh, headquarters, the last two platoons were stationed and ready, defending, and uh, were ready to, to leave. So two Chinooks came in, the H-47s, and my platoon loaded up on one. Uh, not far away, a Delta company had a platoon that was going to load up on the other Chinook. Well, what's incredible is that when the other platoon and Delta company loaded up and joined mortars, and the mortar squad and two of their members, three of the aircraft, uh, members besides Eric Reed, who was the co-pilot, pilot, co-pilot, crew chief, dual gunner, a couple from the mortar squad, and about 25 members of Delta Company's uh, platoon. The lieutenant in charge was told that someone had forgotten to collect some claymores in a large bag. There's no way we could leave those claymores behind. They would be used against us. The enemy certainly knew how to use claymores. They're extremely deadly. So after some quick discussion, the lieutenant asked his uh, RTO, his radio man, to come with him. And they got off of that Chinook and said that he'll call in for the major or the colonel to come pick him up. So what, what was remarkable is that you got to understand, this was enemy territory. We're the last to leave. We know we're being monitored and observed. And yet this lieutenant decided to get off because he felt it was his responsibility, even though one of his men made the mistake. I'm listening to some of the conversation on the radio myself, and I'm saying, well, this lieutenant definitely has some stones. I mean, to be able to do that, uh, he'd be the only two left on the ground, and he'd have to rely on a chopper coming fairly quickly to pick him up before they could be captured. Well, at that point, our platoon, my platoon was loaded and ready to go, so we took off. Soon after us, the other Chinook left. And sure enough, the lieutenant went back, got the claymores, and had to wait for a loach, a light observation helicopter, to come pick him up. And I believe it was the a Major or, or Colonel Coleman, one of the two, went back and picked him up. Actually, and now I remember, it was the major because Colonel Coleman could not join us at LZ Judy. He went on to Mary Ann. In any event, here we are now in Chinooks, which make an awful lot of noise. We're all stuffed in this. I hated riding in Chinooks because you're in a flying coffin, in my view. You can't do anything. You can't fire. There's no windows. I don't have a parachute. And, you know, maybe I'm, I was airborne qualified. So, you know, the idea of jumping, you know, would give me another opportunity to prevent disaster. So with the incredible noise, the trip, fortunately, was not too long. As I recall, it was something like 15, 20 minutes. And here we come into uh, LZ Judy, which was basically a mountaintop that was blown up, blown off, cleared out. And tree stumps everywhere, and it was just a jangled mess of equipment and personnel and so forth. 
And on this mountain, at one side, on the north side, it was a ridge line that joined another mountain and a ridge line of, of uh, jungle. And so this ridge line was very narrow. I mean, certainly maybe the, the length of a Chinook, maybe two lengths of a Chinook wide. So you didn't have much error. And you had to land on this unload. Well, uh, and there's a loading party there waiting for us uh, because of uh, other equipment that we were bringing. So we came in, and as Chinooks come in, they kind of, they come in straight, and then they slow, and the rear of the aircraft kind of drops down as it tries to put on the brakes, and then levels off and goes straight down into uh, the landing. Once those doors opened up, the back lift, man, I got out of there as fast as I could. And I'm yelling, let's go up the hill. And as we're climbing up the hill, and it was a pretty steep vertical, it was definitely a, <laughs> a, a mountaintop. And if you see the pictures, you will know uh, it was not trivial. And so we, we scrambled up as fast as we could to get away from the LZ. And I had just gotten to the bunker that was assigned to me. And then I, my focus was to ensure that the rest of my platoon was properly positioned in each of the other bunkers as we were securing that north side of the LZ. Well, as I turned, I could watch the other Chinook, the last one, leaving Cam Duck. As it was coming in, he was no more than 150 yards away from the landing. And I, I, I still can hear the rat-tat-tat of an AK-47, the unmistakable sound of an AK-47 that opened up with a burst of fire just below and on the opposite side. And it was point blank. I mean, no one could miss firing into that Chinook. It was so big, and it was such an obvious target. And as he unloaded, I watched what happened, and the Chinook tried to stop. It kind of stumbled and then started to fall backwards and tilted and kept falling and falling down as if it lost all its power, hit the treetops, tumbled and just smashed and exploded. I mean, I'm, I'm watching this. My mouth is wide open. I am, my eyes, are, I cannot believe what just happened. It turns out that this was the most deadly helicopter crash taken down by hostile fire in the entire Vietnam War. It was incredible to see this, and worse, because there were mortars on board, and because the mortar squad also had illumination rounds, white phosphorus, Willie Pete, we call them. And then you had all the ammunition of 25 infantry soldiers, fully loaded with all their gear. That Chinook burst and exploded for hours. It was impossible to get very close to it. Although, when it went down and hit the trees that broke open, the co-pilot was the only one who fell out. And because it was such a steep slope, I mean, we're talking, it was very steep, steep. He tumbled out and then rolled down the mountain until he hit some rocks that stopped him. That was the only thing because it was so steep, but it got him away from the aircraft. As the aircraft was exploding right there, not far from him, and as I remember, one report said that the actual wheels landed very right next to him from the aircraft. But he was all busted up, of course, and burned, and uh, it, it was a tough situation for him. His name was Eric Reed. We were other soldiers that were on the LZ itself. Some went down immediately and were able to find him. It's unbelievable that they found him. We really couldn't approach the aircraft, as I recall, for two days because it was so hot, it was burning so much, the explosions were constantly going off. The entire aircraft melted to nothing. I mean, it was just a burn spot on the ground. You couldn't tell anything more than just a little burn spot. It was completely evaporated in the fire that followed. Well, as it turns out, as the chopper was coming down and hit the treetops, 
the blades broke off and the blades were like boomerangs and they flipped up onto the LZ itself and actually killed one of the waiting soldiers. And I believe it even almost decapitated him, as well as several others were wounded in the waiting party to unload that aircraft. My platoon stared in disbelief because we were in the Chinook immediately before that last one that came in. And it was just a few minutes separating us from death. And the entire platoon would have been gone. Well, as it turns out, Delta Company lost the platoon. Well, let me come back. While this is all happening, here comes a, this loach, this small helicopter, with the platoon lieutenant and the RTO. And they are looking down, and they're seeing what's happening. And at first, I don't think they realized it was their platoon. Once the pilot learned that it was his platoon, he bypassed LZ Judy and flew on to July. And I think at that point, he was reassigned and never came back out to the field because he literally lost his whole platoon. And it had to be so traumatic. Well, for us, LZ Judy, I remember one of the uh, troops had a portable radio and he turned on the song. And the, and the song was, Julie, Julie, do you love me? And I was thinking it was, Judy, Judy, do you love me? And of course, I thought, where was the love that day for all of those soldiers? <sighs> so much love was, was lost. But as soon as that helicopter hit the trees, the howitzers on top of LZ Judy, I mean, they lowered their barrels and they unloaded almost in machine gun rapidity. Just as fast as they could pull those levers and shoot, they just blasted that whole mountainside. I mean, they blasted everything they could. Bang, 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 bang. It was an amazing response, but of course, too late. Then we were ordered platoons to go off and patrol all around. We went deep down and trying to search out who was there and whatnot. Although my platoon did not make contact with the enemy, another platoon did, uh, and several enemy were killed. I don't have the, the total killed and wounded. In my case, you know, cutting through the jungle and, and going up and down these steep slopes. And then finally we arrived at one on this one day. I think it was about two, two weeks later because the crash happened on August 26, 1970. A couple of weeks later, we found a flat area. We were exhausted. So I positioned the, the platoon to rest for a couple hours at midday. It was really hot and we were exhausted. And some of the guys were playing poker, just fun poker. One of them was our medic. He was fairly new. He had only been in country for, uh, I think it was maybe a month or two. And then he was assigned to my platoon because my other medic, uh, who I had uh, real problems with, I thought he was a terrible medic. And here they sent me this guy that was a drop off from med school and was smart and handsome. And he was sharp. I just really liked this guy. And I thought, this is great great for the platoon and whatnot. Well, apparently he had to stand up and reach into his pocket and get some money. And all of a sudden, just one shot rang out. Again, an AK-47. And the shot hit him in his hip. And when it hit his hip, the bullet went literally lateral across his abdomen, hit the other side of his hip, and then out. It ripped the whole midsection of his body, and he died of shock on the scene. And I was just so, so frustrated and so upset about it all. But I can tell you that LZ Judy stands in memory today with so many soldiers who passed. I have spoken to the sister of, of Corporal Hickman, who died. You know, she still carries the burden, the memory to this day and has actually written a book and is working on her second book about the war. My brother, Corporal Hickman, who died as part of the 25 soldiers of Delta Company, uh, second of the 1st Infantry, 196th Infantry Brigade. I was in Bravo Company, uh, 3rd Platoon Bravo, of the 2nd and 1st, 196th. And because it was going to take a number of platoons to protect this 
new LZ. It was an unfortunate placement of an LZ that could be exposed to that kind of fire, but such is war. So that's the story of LZ Judy, front to back. I was not soon, not too long after my medic was killed, that I was taken out and brought to Hawk Hill so that I could become the headquarters company commander, actually, what they call headquarters and headquarters company commandant for the battalion. So that's the story of LZ Judy. I honor them. I grieve for them to this very day and will for the rest of my life. Thank you, Mac. Thank you, John, for telling us that gut-wrenching story. It was a terrible thing for so many people to have to die like that, not only in the crash of a Chinook, but also it was hurt just as much to lose someone like that medic. The whole thing was terrible. I just hope that we learn something from it and we'll make different decisions in the future where so many people won't have to die. But thank you so much for telling that story. I'm sure it will stay with everybody who heard it. Well, thank you, Mac. I, I again, appreciate the fact that we're, we're using this technology, this new communications medium, to record important events in our history. Unlike what I see today, uh, some effort to erase history, America is about its history, about its travails, its problems, and its ability to overcome them and have a continuous improvement model uh, built into the Constitution that allows us to craft a unique mode of governance in all of human history that brings life, liberty, and yes, the freedom to pursue happiness as people choose. It is everything. And these soldiers, they saluted the flag. They were buried under the flag. And I will kneel for them and God only. Thank you very much, John, for being willing to stand up and say these things. More people need to do it. And I appreciate you doing it. And I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Thank you very much. This is Mac Payne closing out episode 1789 of the Vietnam Veteran News Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. You are cordially invited to return again soon and often to listen to more stories coming your way on this podcast, the Vietnam Veteran News. How about that? Ain't that a mess?